I got a new reading chair. I say new, but it's not like I had an old one. This is the first time in my life I've had a reading chair. And she's gorgeous. She's green velvet. <laughs> I love her so much. I'm even dressing like her. I mean, it's so soft. <gasps> Why am I sitting on the floor? Could I, oh, oh. could I sit in my chair for this video? Oh my God. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. This is so exciting. I don't know. Oh. Hello? Is this better? Oh, my head's too close to the thing. What if I lean down? More cash like. Although, am I just showing you my crotch? That's not fun. This? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Who knew filming in the reading chair would be such an event? I'm literally out of breath. I've gotten up to refocus like five times. The jury's out on whether I'm in focus because the camera is too far away and I can't press all the focus off without it. I'm tired. <laughs> I started this video with so much enthusiasm and now I'm exhausted. Who knew my reading chair would betray me like this? Anyway, welcome to the video. Do let me know if this setup is good, bad. I, I want opinions. Um, this is the survey. What do we think of this? Is it worth the stress? Who knows? Should I hire a glamorous assistant who can focus it for me while I'm sat here? Because I'm just, I do this on my own, you know, no one helps me with it, you know, so I have to sit here and then, you know, film it and then like I have to run back and check and if it's not in focus I have to rejig a little bit and then if it, it's a lot. So <laughs> do let me know if it's worth it. <laughs> Although, I mean, if this whole thing is just out of focus, it, I'll answer the question myself. It, it's not worth it at all, is it? <laughs> anyway, today's video is a video that I've seen uh, a couple of months ago on some other people's channel. So obviously, obviously, I am coming in late. Coming in late to, oh my god, to the trend, as always. So today I'm going to be reading one star reviews of some of my favourite books. I'm quite nervous, actually, I'm not gonna lie, because I do get quite stressed when I recommend my favourite books to my uh, friends in real life and they read them in real time and I get reactions. I do get quite stressed because reading, obviously, is a very personal thing and if someone hates something you love, it's, it's never pleasant. And I had some trouble with planning this video because I'm not gonna lie, like, I don't really know what my favourite books are. That sounds dumb, but it's true. There are definitely books that I've loved, but I'm like, oh, is that my favourite? Is that my favourite? Because it just seems like such a prestigious title to bestow upon a book, and I don't want to do it willy-nilly. So whenever, whenever people ask me, what's your favourite book? Like, what's your favourite film? I can never, I, I never, I don't know. I just don't know. I just, I don't know. So here we go. We're going to start off strong with Strange the Dreamer, because I love that book so much, I feel like I cannot fault that book. Everything about it is flawless. This is gonna be hard. Goodreads, hello, my old friend. Okay, the first thing I'm seeing is the ratio of, you know, what stars, and I'm very happy to say that five stars is the majority ratio. I am <laughs> in the majority, I'm not ruffling any feathers. Nice. Um, so let's go on and have a look at <laughs> someone. <laughs> <laughs> so the top review is just, it wasn't my cup of tea, which, sure. For me, it wasn't my cup of tea is like a kind of two star review. Like it wasn't for me, but there's some merit there. I feel like a one star is like you didn't, you actively didn't like it rather than it just wasn't for you. But you know, that's just me. We all rate books in different ways. It's fine. And then we've got a couple of DNFs, which, I know that's a thing that I should do, 
but I never do. So it feels a bit foreign to me whenever I see people DNFing books and then giving them reviews. I'm like, how the fuck do you know what to say if you didn't finish it? But anyway. Okay, so there's this other person who DNF'd complaining about purple prose. I've heard this phrase before, um, and to me purple prose just means like impressive writing or like flowery, people think pretentious, overly descriptive. I feel like for Stranger Dreamer it fits the plot. That book is about myth and legend and folklore, it's about the power of stories, it's about the lasting effect of language and words and that words have meaning and power and the naming of things is powerful and meaningful. Um, so I feel like that's a book which needs that lyrical prose to communicate that story. But, like I said, <laughs> that's just me! But the, this person who's complaining about the purple prose has, has pointed out some quotes that, let's say, did not work for them. They've said, this purple prose is killing me. The quote is, blue as opals, pale blue, blue as cornflowers or dragonfly wings, or spring, not summer sky. Well, I think that's pretty. <laughs> this is such a bad idea, I'm just getting angry. <laughs> Is this a poorly written book? No. I agree, we're off to a good start. <laughs> so why didn't I like it? I had to sit with my thoughts for a bit to determine the final answer. It's simple, this book is boring. <laughs> Sing through the pain, everything's fine. <laughs> the book starts off promising with a likeable main character. He is likeable, I do love Laszlo meeting the ever-lovable, downtrodden, orphan trope. Yes. He works in a library and his love of stories is infectious. It is. Um, the idea of a lost city where he can go to find himself and break free of his bonds is exciting. Yes, it is. <laughs> However, nothing of consequence ever really happens in this story. There is a strange mix of POVs where sometimes chapters are individualised and other times they're shared. There is a rivalry that never really comes to a head and the romantic angle was a dud. There were other characters who had some interesting things going on but we never heard their stories. The book ended abruptly, obviously there will be further books, but it was poorly executed. Even the whole ethereal, godspawn, child villain angle never really got the blood pumping. This book was so flowery in its language that it never had any bite. I disagree with that, obviously. Um, there was nothing substantial for the reader to hang on to. There was nothing that gripped me as a reader. Mm -hmm, I think it's very exciting. But I get it, if you're going into Stranger Dreamer expecting like a rip-roaring adventure, sort of like Six of Crows, like high stakes, high octane thrills, it's not that type of story. I mean, it's a fantasy novel about the power of stories and storytelling and it is, like I say, it derives on like old Greek myths like, you know, gods and the children of gods and magical powers and the fact that those powers can be used for good or for bad and it's also about dreams and <sighs> the only thing I sort of agree with is that maybe yeah the, the the romantic subplot isn't the most interesting it is signposted in the novel very early on that you know this is a romantic sort of subplot and I think it does expect you to root for this couple and I won't lie like I was a bit indifferent but I found them both really interesting as characters so it was like I won't be heartbroken if they break up but I won't be whooping for joy if they get together. Okay so I'm skimming through some other reviews. A lot of people are just DNFing it which like I get it but you don't give it one star. Like if it's just not for you like don't read it. Someone else is saying this book is a romantic tragedy. The last two thirds of this book evoked only one emotion for me, dread. I think the book is grossly mismarketed. The cheerful blue and gold cover with butterflies is a moth, actually. Um, it's a moth. And the blurb text saying, the dream chooses the dreamer, not the other way around, and listing various mysteries made me expect a light-hearted adventure story. I don't know, to me the cover, like, yes, it's bright and it's gorgeous, um, but, like, blue is like a, a melancholy colour. To me it's like a calming cover. It's blue. It's kind of reminiscent of water and like the sky you know to me it didn't scream 
rip-roaring adventure ride because usually in those types of books it's like the characters on the front with like knives and hair blowing in the wind or whatever to me it's sort of like a calming intricate design which to me reflects the tone of the book but I don't know I don't know I don't know <laughs> so another point in this review is there's no resolution at the end Maybe that's because there's a second book, brah. And then it says, if it weren't for those two things, I might be giving this book five stars. Sorry, um, your two issues were the cover, which was not the author's choice, or, you know, the author probably had very little to do with the cover. Also, it doesn't really affect the book itself. And the second point was that the story wasn't finished at the end. But there's a second book! What? What? Sorry, I'm trying not to be rude, but like, if you're giving it one star and you're listing those two things as the problem and saying if those two things weren't a thing it would get five stars. Why are you giving it one star if it deserves five? I kept reading hoping that at the end there would be some satisfactory conclusion but there was no catharsis, just the sudden stop. Have you never read a series before? Oh my god. What are you doing? I'm so confused. Wow, okay. Okay, there are a few reviews complaining about the romance, which is like, do you know what? Fair enough, the romance is not the draw of the book. I mean, yeah, the romance doesn't make your heart flutter, but to me that didn't matter so much because the rest was stunning. It wasn't engaging, it described every nonsense detail, nobody was moving the plot, a lot overly pretentious. Okay, I found like a sort of deconstruction of the romance. So maybe like light spoilers if you don't want to know who likes who in this book but it's fairly obvious from early on. Um, someone says I hate mm and mm's relationship uh, like she's some kind of maiden content with just being with him for the rest of her life when she has been trapped her whole childhood and then some. Seriously couldn't the author be bothered with giving Sarai at least some more aspirations which she didn't throw out the window the second a man appears. Do you know what though like yes if you put it in black and white out of context like that it doesn't make sense why she you know why would this woman just throw everything away for this this guy but like Sarai has been trapped alone on a floating palace forever. She has lived through some really traumatic memories and she enters into people's dreams at night and these dreams are filled with terror and fear and screaming and blood and torture and pain and then she enters into Laszlo's head and it's different, it's magical and he makes her laugh and it's her only solace from her loneliness and her isolation and it's her only reprieve from this life of reliving trauma. So yes, if you put it in black and white, she throws everything away for a man, like the first time she meets him. Like, yeah, it sounds stupid out of context, but within the story, it makes sense because of her background, because of his background, because of the context in which it happens. I don't think it's just shoved in there for no reason. I think it makes sense why Sarai feels drawn to Laszlo and why he feels drawn to her. And Laszlo, he spends his whole life dreaming and suddenly meets a girl and then after knowing her for like a week decides that life wouldn't be worth living without her. Sure, but also take into consideration Laszlo's background. He was an unloved orphan uh, sent from pillar to post, never had a place to call his own, never really had a genuine connection with somebody. He's lived his life through stories. He has drowned himself in mythology and folklore and fairy tales and he works at a library and it's his life mission to breathe life into these stories once again and convince everyone that Weep is a real city that exists beyond the walls of the library. Like, he's a romantic at heart. He reads fairy tales about big grand epic journeys all the time. It just makes sense to me. Like, I get it, sure, you know, if you were to put it in black and white, yes, it happens very quickly. Yes, you could label it as insta-love. But both of those characters have backgrounds and feelings and hearts that make that make sense. Should I pick another favourite book? Do you know what? I feel, looking at my shelves, the ones that I've loved, for example, I loved Starless Sea and I loved um, The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue 
and when I have seen bad reviews of those books it's sort of along the similar vein of why people don't like Stranger Dreamer. It's like for the Star of the Sea it's like it's confusing, the prose is pretentious, it has no plot, it's meandering, la 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 la. Um, and yes I can see why it would read that way but to me it's gorgeous, it's wonderful. Um, and same for Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, people are like there's no plot, it's too long, the prose is just there to be pretty. I mean I don't get, I just <laughs> I don't understand because to me so much of the joy of reading is the rhythm and the musicality of the language, to hear certain words uh, put next to each other so that their meaning becomes something more. For example, like something that stuck out to me recently, I was reading um, a Margaret Atwood poem from her new collection and there is a poem in which she's talking about a cat and she describes that the cat walks moth-footed, right? And that doesn't make sense. She's like jammed together two words that you wouldn't normally see together, but it perfectly describes what she means. It's like the the brush of the paw against the carpet is soft, like a, a moth's wing against something. Like it's a, a soft, uh, barely there sort of whisper, you know? I'm going off on a tangent, I know, but I love writers that play with language and that so much of the joy of reading their stories is about the way that they're written and the way that they're told. Um, and yes, of course plot is important, of course character is important, but I just don't understand looking at language as a barrier somehow to the enjoyment of, of the novel. I, I just don't get that. And I think all of them actually, Stranger Dreamer, Adi LaRue and Sarsi are about the inherent power of stories. Obviously Stranger Dreamer and Star of Sea, they both have elements of them that are about uh, libraries and stories being recorded throughout time and history. Then also Adi LaRue is about a great expanse of history and about Adi not being able to leave a mark and not being able to be part of the, the story of history, the, the, the tapestry of, of history. Um, and so I think that's a theme that I'm probably drawn to a lot is about the power of the written word and what that means to communicate something through writing and leave a mark in that way um, and you know influence people who then read that. So yeah, if you know any books that are similar to those that I've talked about just now, do let me know because it seems that that really vibes with me and I, I do understand the common criticisms that people have but also I love them. And I was recently reminded of my absolute adoration for The Cruel Prince because I recommended it to my friend Rowan and she has now sped through the series. Um, and I love that book for so many reasons um, and I really want to reread it now since having um, have like vicariously experienced it through my friend Rowan again uh, but I'm just gonna do a quick glance at the reviews I'm scared okay again I'm fairly happy with the ratio it has received mostly five star ratings and the one star is very much in the minority so good sign <laughs> right the first one is just complaining about it being hyped that's not the book's fault, that's a, that's a you problem. Storyline starts off quite tragic. It does, it starts off very tragic because as they've pointed out, Jude's parents are being brutally killed off from the bat. From that I was expecting some kind of revenge story or emotionally harrowing character development because to witness that when you're young will obviously take a toll. And it does, it does take a toll on, on our Jude. But no, that wasn't explored. Right off the bat our main character goes on to enter some kind of tournament she has no experience in whatsoever. There's nothing ingrained within her to take this challenge. Um, yes, but there is. Like you literally just said her parents were brutally murdered in front of her so that left a mark and the mark is that she is human and fragile and weak and in the land of Fae she needs to prove herself and get stronger so that she can be an equal match to the like many threats around her. I think Jude all the time feels her fragility because she is only human and I think you know her entering into this tournament is her way of trying to overcome that to make everyone forget that she is but a mere mortal a fragile human but that's just that's just me I don't 
I don't know. I don't like confrontation. I know this isn't even confrontation. I'm just like reading words on a screen, but it feels like confrontation. It feels like a personal attack <laughs> on me because I love, I love Jude. I think she's such an interesting character. Um, uh, God, I haven't hated a book this much since Caravel. Oh babe, I also hated Caravel, so I feel you there. Um, I didn't hate Caraval, it was just disappointing. All right, okay, that's enough of that. Ooh, let's do The Night Circus, because I'm not gonna lie, I've not read that book in centuries, so uh, I feel a bit weird defending it, because I, I, <laughs> I've not read it in ages, but we'll, we'll, we'll have a look, let's have a look. Ooh, I didn't actually rate this five stars, I rated it four. Interesting. But yet again, the majority of the reviews are five star and the minority is definitely one star. <laughs> so the top review is sending me. It's, I never expected to like this book just from the title. I knew it wasn't for me. Why read it, Becky? Why read it then, honey? Familiar again, nothing happened in this book, purple prose. Uh, you feel like you're in a fairy tale because the author's, author's sentences flow like flower petals in the wind and then you keep on reading and reading and the writing is still fucking magical but also nothing has really happened and then you're at the end of the book where the writing is still so fucking magical but still nothing happened. Honey, you just described a beautiful experience, a fairy tale, the words are like flower petals in the wind. In what world is this a criticism? Babe, come on, have some respect for the written word, I beg of you. And again, we're coming across a flurry of reviews where it's beautifully written, too much pretty writing, overly detailed, yeah, no plot, I, I get it, right. So what we're learning here is that if you, yes, you watching this video, if you have ever read a book where you thought the prose was too flowery, too pretentious, too beautiful, and that there was not enough plot, recommend that book to me right now because I will probably love it. <laughs> Should I do my absolute fave? The absolute queen weaver of words, Miss Angela Carter. Oh my god, now I'll actually cry. Fuck off if anyone's given this one star. Mm -hmm. I'm actually scared to check, oh my god. The ratio is concerning me already. <laughs> there are more four star reviews than five star reviews, but the one is still very much the minority. But here, we oh my god, I'm genuinely quite terrified. I fucking love Angela Carter. I think she's honestly, the, she has written things that have left me like physically speechless and unable to, carry on reading until I've processed the beauty of what she's just written and that is I think one of the only authors that has done that for me um, just left me completely in awe and with only short stories as well I've only read The Bloody Chamber which is her collection of short stories like I you know w what she could do with a whole novel I Jesus I don't know okay again someone's saying they didn't like the writing style okay but sorry you're just wrong I mean I know you're not supposed to say that but you're just wrong <laughs> you're just wrong I'm sorry Someone says, I had high expectations. Yep, Carter's fairy tale retellings are meant to be well known for being feminist, gothic, and original. For the most part, I didn't feel that was true. Having a few heroines with sexual agency didn't magically make them feminist or groundbreaking. It takes a lot more than that to modernize a fairy tale. There were only a couple of them that I actually found somewhat enjoyable. The rest were rubbish. Hated the writing. It was convoluted. I can't do this. I'm it was convoluted, complicated, and nonsensical. That there were a number of times I got lost as to what the hell was going on and had to keep rereading sentences over and over to get some clarity. Also, some sentences read more like paragraphs than sentences. They never bloody ended. All right. I realized that the, the, the card on my camera has filled up because I was just staring in like absolute disbelief for about five minutes at this one review and now I've run out of space on my camera so I'm gonna have to wrap this up in lightning speed but I hope this video was enjoyable uh, even though I am like very on edge right now and I'm probably gonna have to like go and have some chocolate and just like calm down for five minutes because I've just had my favourite books slandered in the most irritating way. <laughs> um, but anyway, this was this was interesting. I mean, I sort of suspected that what I love about all of the, my favourite books is the flowery, beautiful language and that just doesn't do it for some people and that's 
totally fine. Um, but like I said, if you have any books that you thought were too pretentious, too beautiful, leave them in the comments, I'll probably eat them up. So uh, thank you so much for watching this video um, and I will see you soon with another one soon. Bye. Also let me know if this chair was a bad idea because I think I'm very out of focus.